Mm -hmm. Nice. Marco is being heard over the internet. Say the things. You have a very nice catchy phrase so that everyone knows about your beautiful voice. Another round of applause for our friend Marco okay. to the second. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a Ready good to rock. Okay. Go ahead. Well, welcome. Uh, one thing I want to start with that I was last year at the event in Firenze, the Open Source Day, as an attendee. It was amazing. So I can't wait for one next year. And yeah, I think big applause to that, please. All right, so we're here tonight to talk about GraphQL. Uh, we will go through a bit of the history and what actually GraphQL means. And then we will see how to measure performance and why performance is such a big thing in GraphQL. So, uh, well, there are three things in this presentation. Showing the cost of GraphQL query. One that my boss is interested in, it's near form. So, we're hiring, we can talk about that later. And this is who I am. I'm a senior developer experience engineer at Nearform, uh, Node Core collaborator. So I mostly work on the Node.js stack and security and open source maintainer. Probably you've heard about Fastify. Let's get started. I like to start my talk with definition. So what GraphQL is, query language for your API. And there are two things that are very important in the statement. One is query language, the other one is API. If I say query language, what other languages think about? SQL, well, most known one, we have SQL, SQL and Cypher. One graph database. So we usually think about databases. But GraphQL is not about databases, it's about applications, query language, application. Why is that? Well, we have to go through a little bit of the history to understand why. We have a query language, but that's not related to so GraphQL was created by um, evolution of the SQL query. Uh, this was basically uh, SQL from the front. So when you, you talk about next stuff, well, 15 years. And this uh, is a paper. SQL was born in 2007, a paper by its creator and talking about the advantages of uh, querying from the front end. This is the, what it looked like at the beginning. So it was a XML. So at the beginning, it was very, very ugly. We are very glad that it evolved. But why the GraphQL? What was the problem that GraphQL needed to solve? So basically, Facebook had a, was born during a, a period where mobile phones have a, a lot of connect, connectivity. So with REST, they had to do a lot of HTTP calls to retrieve uh, if you check comments, a list of comments, people that are inside the, a lot of HTTP requests, period where uh, files had very low, low connectivity. It was so they said, okay, let's make everything inside one HTML. Let's put all the data that we need, big HTML, them solved and arrived at the GraphQL that we need. So the cool thing about GraphQL is that it provides a uh, even development is that it's the client who decides which which kind of data requires. This is good because if you have an application, a web application, or you have um, 
mobile application sharing backend can no? okay. okay so yeah it's great because depending on where you are data you can and the server is of the front end and all the possible possible operation client so how many of you use graphql like to use this yeah we have a query like and developers have project structure see on the server you define data structures and it's going And this is a qu what a query looks like. So you query for developer skills, name of the whole developer. Well, now stick to the transfer. What does it mean? Have you ever used SOAP? SOAP, like GraphQL, is a transport layer. So it's a way to represent the structure data but tell you how to try when isn't a specification developers mention fql is served over http because dot call out there and usually uh, post and hash graph i've also seen get and and the actual transfer is just as uh, the GraphQL operation query mutation. We're going and basically the GraphQL uh, engine that interprets what you bring well and tries to work. Also going important was were all only query. So GraphQL was just query language. But then they noticed, okay, maybe we can change information on the backend. We can reuse pieces of code. So they invented fragments, which is just a piece of logic that can be shared with between multiple queries and mutation, and it looks like this. So you define it as fragment, and the point is that. You usually, uh, instead of um, basically doing this, last name, just write name parts, and you can reuse uh, the same piece in many queries. In near form, we help our customer to improve uh, the performance of the application. So we talk a lot about performance, and we go to how to improve of 1% your backend performance, and and tools that we usually use are Fastify and Mercurio. So the, all the code examples that we're going to see tonight are based on that. As we said, um, uh, like your typical GraphQL application might just look like this. So you have a GraphQL client written in and whatever cool framework you use, uh, uh, React, uh, Quick, uh, Angular, whatever you want. We have a uh, backend server that contains the solvers and also the schema of data and we have third party api and database like this is the simplest representation of a graphql application that you can get so this is a key point the resolvers are the actual function that are responsible for populating the data that you query from the client so on the client you're asking for the list of developers resolvers go on the database, go on our third-party API, retrieve that 
data and send it back to your client. This is what a resolver looks like. So basically, when you ask for users, it's going to return you all the users based on the ID that you passed. So if you want user with ID 1, this resolver retrieves you the user. The thing is that uh, when you, want, you have a large application, you want to scale, and you want to have microservices, which is, are like the coolest trend right now. You want to, like, I'm sure that you all are using microservices in one way or another. And Mercurius, it's uh, like GraphQL in general, it's great because you can split your schemas into microservices, and then you have just one gateway that reroutes all the traffic to the right um, microservice. We're going to see that. So, this is what uh, uh, federation looks, looks like. So you have like your front ends, and you have a gateway, which is very similar to the to a normal uh, REST gateway. And then you have your uh, underlying services, your federated services, can be product, can also be REST services, because uh, it doesn't matter for the gateway. Uh, like for the gateway, everything is a resolver. So the, the gateway knows where to retrieve the data, and if it's a third party API, it's database, it's another GraphQL uh, service, it doesn't matter. And this allows you to build your um, architecture, which in, in very different ways and with different um, kind of pieces. But let's see how this works under the hood. So Gateway actually queries the federated service for the schema. So on startup, when you start your application, <coughs> Gateway, Gateway sends a special kind of query to every federated service so that the Gateway has to know the IP of those services, and then queries all of them and asks them, give me your schema, and merges it into one big schema. So when you query your gateway, uh, the gateway knows which part of that schema is uh, connected to which microservice, and it's going to reroute that call for you. So I call them different resolvers. They don't really have a name, but they are just resolvers, but uh, so basically, uh, it's what, what we talked about. So yeah, this talk is about performance, but until now, we didn't talk about performance. This was just a bit of introduction on the history and like how GraphQL works for everybody. But now we're going to dive a little bit into that. So how many of you have been in this situation? Like your page is really slow, taking a lot of time to load and you don't know why. So first thing that you do, developer tools. You go on the developer tools, you're going to see network and say, okay, uh, this is low because of this, this is low because of that. But you know, with GraphQL, you cannot do that. Because what you see is just one HTTP call, because GraphQL is passed on HTTP, and there's just one HTTP call for all the data that you're querying. So you only see the total response time, which could be in seconds or minutes, if it's bad. And that's not going to help you. So how do we debug that? And also when you have a federation, uh, if we, as we said, we have many federated services. So if just one of them is slow, your whole application is going to be slow. Because the gateway needs to retrieve every single piece of data that you are querying before returning the response. So if one of them has some kind of problem, well, you're going to have a problem too. So where is the, where it could be? It could be literally everywhere. Yeah, and this is what happened. So if you're, if you're running a GraphQL in production and you have a large environment and you have a problem, you need something to find where the problem is and you need it fast. Of course, it's very important to use tools to monitor performance, metric, centralized logging, and I'm sure that you all do that, right? But that's something that's kind of expensive, and it takes time to build the infrastructure, and it takes DevOps to do all the, the DevOps thingy. So you don't have that immediately. So let's see where the problem could lie, because if you're using a 
an application, for example, in Node.js, your problem could be in the HTTP layer. For example, you have a, you're using Express and your backend is very slow, and like uh, it's it's taking a lot of time to uh, to receive requests and work on them. Or it could also be your API layer. Uh, for example, um, you are using uh, old GraphQL library, so it has some problem into parsing the abstract syntax tree, and <coughs> like all your APIs are not written properly. So th there is a lot of factors into that, but also resolvers. For example, you are, you are calling a third party APIs from somewhere, from anywhere or database, God knows where, and that could be slow. For example, uh, it goes into timeout, like that could happen with any HTTP call. So it could be a slow resolver, for example, could be caching, like you said, caching wrong, so you're not you're uh, not hitting the cache, and it's making it slow. Or it could be, as we said, database. It could be basically whatever. With GraphQL, you have uh, a lot of uncertainties, and if you're using a federation, those uncertainties are spread towards your architecture. So let's see what are the common performance issues. Overfetching, the most common one. Like you're literally asking more than you need. With fragments, we see before, that you basically can reuse pieces of code with among other queries. But sometimes we are lazy. So we take one fragment that has, for example, a field more than we need and we say, well, I have these fragments ready, then why should I create one, a new one? So we just use it and we ask for more than we need, and, but if we ask a lot more, uh, that's going to cause a lot of overhead. Or for example, in a federation, if you're uh, asking an extra field that it's in another service, you are going to do a, a, um, another HTTP, the, uh, you are doing an extra HTTP call in the, in the network for that extra field that you don't need. It's um, like, you, the, the most important thing is to be careful when, when using fragments because it's the most common case. The other one is the slow resolver function. As we said, uh, resolvers usually fetch data from APIs, or database, whatever. You need to handle your timeouts properly and also errors. Like This is very important because if you have long timeouts, the whole uh, GraphQL call is going to take a lot of time. Caching. I actually didn't write a slide for caching because caching in GraphQL is such a huge uh, topic that it requires a talk just by itself. In GraphQL, you want to cache everything. You want to cache on the front end, you want to cache on the back end, you want to cache everywhere. Like It's very important, it's, uh, it's, it's what makes it very performant because with GraphQL, it's very easy to cache. Because most of the time you are asking for static data, and if you're not, you might want to use subscriptions. So use cache. And the n plus one <coughs> problem, we're going to see this in detail. This is also a very common problem. Uh, I will try to explain uh, as clearly as I can, but it's not the easiest one. Let's see. So imagine that we have this schema that we saw before. We have developers, and every developer has a list of projects. So we have a, we will have a list of developers and a list for each developer of their projects. So this is what our resolver looks like. Like imagine I just want to write my first application. Okay, this is how I retrieve developers. Select start from developers. It gives me the list of every developer. Then I'm like, okay, let's write another resolver for developers. Select star from project where developer id equals to id. Okay, so I'm just querying the database for every id that I receive. I ask for the project. But these results, if we just do the query, so developers and the project, we see that we are actually doing one first query to ask for all developers, and then three queries. This is not good, right? Like you don't want to do all these queries for just something that you could group. 
So in Mercurius, we have something called loaders, data loaders, which allow you to batch queries. And so we delete our resolver, and we create this loader. So it basically does the same thing, but allows you to batch these queries. So the result is that we have just one query when we retrieve all the developers, all the projects. Exactly, and this is very important for performance. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of troubles because queries are expensive. So you want to group them as possible. And like this are the most common one. So like we can say that it's kind of hard to troubleshoot the performance of a GraphQL application because there are many factors and probably there are even more factors than using a traditional REST architecture. So yeah, exactly. In a federation, the problems like multiply by 10 at least. So we, the problem are we can only see the total cost of a query from the developer tools. It's very hard to spot expensive fields, especially if you're using fragments. So generally speaking, we say it's also hard to optimize a slow query because we need the tools to understand why it's slow. SQL, which is another query language, as we talked before, has a keyword explain. How many of you has used the explain keyword? OK, almost everybody. And you know that it's crucial to understand why a query is low, what a query is actually doing. So yeah, this is what um, like um, uh, explain looks like. You have for every single step, you have time, usage, rows, etc., etc. I wish, I really wish there was an explain keyword in SQL, but no, the reason. This is for many reasons. Usually, uh, application like libraries need to update because standard change and evolve. In GraphQL, it's actually the opposite. People need to start to do cool things with GraphQL. They become the standard, but they are not standardized by anyone. La the last paper that uh, standardized GraphQL from was from 2021. And it didn't uh, mention <coughs> federations and a lot of stuff that the ecosystem has created to update it. So probably one day we will see it. I don't know. So one thing that you really, really want in GraphQL is to track the start and end time for each resolver. Like you know when a resolver started and when it ended. Because then you know how much time it took and if it's slow or not. So in Node.js, you have a very cool thing, which is called process HR time, that allows you to track in nanoseconds the time of something, like start and end. So we, com we, can, we would like to compute the total time and return that uh, time to the client. So why to client? Because GraphQL is based on client. Like front-end developers are the real users of GraphQL. So they want to see, they won't be able to see what's going on from the client. And in Neoform, we actually did it. Because uh, we were working on a big project where we're using GraphQL from an actual Italian company. And they are using GraphQL with Mercurius in production. So we needed to see where the problem was. And we created this plugin called Mercurial Explain, where you can actually see for uh, like um, extra field in the response of the, Graph of the GraphQL response, which has a field explain with a profiler that returns all the uh, performance data relative to the query. And it's a, it's a great one because we, will, we were able to track uh, everything and see how many times our resolver was called. And it was important to know how many times our resolver was called because we could make sure that we didn't have the n plus one problem. So if we saw that we were doing uh, a lot of uh, resolver calls, maybe we could patch things and improve them. So it has a, uh, many cool features, but I don't want to talk about them. This is an open source project that you can see on GitHub. And if you want to use it, that would be great. So this is how it basically looks. <coughs> So for every 
the query you have like the path, the begin, and time in nanoseconds. You have the how many times that a server has been called. And in a federation, it does that, but it merges this uh, explained field from every single resource, for every single services that's federated. So you can use that in a federation, and it helps a lot to troubleshoot where you are performance issue. But, as I said, GraphQL is for the clients who want to be able to test it from the client side. So how do we do that? So on SQL, you have your amazing uh, benchmark. But for GraphQL, we have uh, GraphQL, which is a simple IDE that runs on your server. And it allows you to test queries in real time, just like this. Let's see if this works. Yeah, it's a bit slow, but it works. You can test them, and you can see the result of it. And you can also see with the, yeah, exactly. You can see all the fields and everything. And with, with that, we created a plugin for GraphQL that allows you to see performance from the uh, front end. And this is what it looks like. It's a bit dark. I'm a big fan of uh, dark mode. So on the left side, you have, you have every path. For every path, you see the time. And you have a waterfall, because we all love waterfall on the uh, Chrome DevTools. We have um, the, the, the uh, resolver count, so we see how many times it has been called. And it's open source. So thanks for listening. This was, you, here you have all my links. Please uh, add me on social media so you can see all the stuff that you do on JS and GraphQL, Fastify, whatever. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I will stay with that, Mark, at this point. Any questions about GraphQL? Since we're all professionals about this new standard, right? Know everything about it? Of course not. Yeah. Right, no shit about it. A question. We have a question. So th these were performance tricks mostly from the server side, right? Uh, as a client, uh, so I have a couple of questions. So what are some common public uh, GraphQL APIs? I know GitHub has one uh, GraphQL API, I don't know if there are others to play with, and if there are performance tricks that clients need to be aware in, uh, okay. in making some requests. So on the client side, uh, so actually on the client side there isn't much you can do because other than asking for more fields and caching, that's basically it. It's a, uh, it's like asking if you can do tricks on the SQL client. If your database is low, there isn't much that you can do about it. And big project that are using uh, GraphQL, like yeah, GitHub, is uh, probably one of the biggest. Uh, Facebook, obviously, is using it. Uh, in Italy, we have uh, Tridom, the, the one that plants tree around. That's you, like, uh, I don't know many projects, but I'm, I'm sure there are a lot, of, a lot of them. Yes. There is open source Wrapped, which is the Spotify open source, which is by showing your head, so you can also go and contribute to that, which is very important. Contributions are essential. Any other questions for Mark? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have one there. I'll bring it to you. Uh, it's, it's more specific question actually that I was wondering if there is some integration with this Mercury and the F sync AWS F sync that we can use because yeah we have the custom resolvers that you put authorization layer then the custom numbers actually could be very crucial to have. So the answer is no because uh, wait. The answer is no, because uh, Mercurius is based on Fastify. So it, it works with the Fastify plugin system. And unfortunately, it doesn't work with Appbase. 
So it's a Matthew Hill's uh, system. Okay. Very well. Any other questions for our friend? Yes. Uh, a question about the federation. And uh, I think maybe a little bit out of scope, but it's about cash mm -hmm. uh, If one um, microservice needs the information by another microservice, they are go to the uh, gateway and they are merged there. So, like, I don't know, uh, microservice about the uh, user and microservice about the comments. Mm -hmm. The comments as a, a user, user that can write the comment, how do they uh, speak each other? So, uh, two, federated key, two federated services cannot talk to each other unless there is a gateway inside because they don't know where the other federated service is. Only the gateway know the IP address and all the info. So what you like, the, the gateway knows everything and has the schema of every federated service matched together. So he is the one who knows which field where it belongs to. So it does the rerouting, but they cannot talk to each other uh, without the, the gateway. So about the performance, we should be smart enough to write the data yes. uh, in a federation way. So, I can say. so usually you want to have your microservice divided by domains so that each domain is isolated from the other one. So if you need if you need data, you probably want to put if you need data that's like uh, very strictly coupled, you want you might want to put that into the same domain and so create your federation like that. But you can also use a REST services too. You can mix them. This is one thing that a lot of people don't talk about GraphQL is that it gives you the flexibility to mix REST and GraphQL. So if you have one, one REST services, you can call that. And it's absolutely no normal and approved. So okay. I hope that answered your question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so, hi. Um, I was thinking about the fact that maybe sometimes you can have like some complex schema and, um, for example, to query some kind of stuff, it takes a lot of time because, you know, it's uh, actually um, context-sensitive. And um, that, can that be like a security issue or maybe someone from the client might inject some kind of query that you know, has some, perform some performance issues, and how would you prevent um, that? So, yes, that's absolutely a thing that they do. Um, like, a lot of vulnerabilities are based on the response time of something, and like when they see that something is slower than than something else, they might use they might think that there is vulnerability involved into that. So for example, the slow load is a task that was on JS. There are a lot of vulnerabilities that are time based. So one thing is to handle timeouts correctly. So you always want to have your max timeout at I don't know, like that depends on your application, but you want you need a timeout that after a certain time, it uh, cancels the query from the gateway. Because the problem is that if you are querying something and the gateway has to go through many federated services, it just needs one slow service and the whole thing gets slow. So that's why it's very important to have timeouts and to have caching. So, and that's why I was saying that caching is very important in GraphQL because most data are static and you just cache them once and you always hit the cache. And so to answer your question, yes, that's very normal and like handling timeouts is the way you solve that. Other questions? No? Yes? No? Okay, go on. 
for you. Um, so we're talking about micro services, federated services, software anywhere in small doses in serverless architectures whatsoever, lambdas all the time. It feels like it's put out there as a solution to any problem that a software engineer might encounter, an architect might encounter in general. Do you think so? If not, what is your stance on this thing? I'm a huge fan of monoliths. 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 So, no, like, when you're creating a like, uh, microservice architecture, you know that your, that, uh, that your architecture is going to be slower than a monolith because there is network between. So you want to be very careful with the tools that you use because they have repercussions, financial uh, performance, and also based on your team. If you have a small team and they're not experienced, you don't want to do microservices because microservice architecture, it reflects, code in general reflects your organization, it reflects your team, how your team is built. If, you're built it, if your team is not built for microservices, it will be a mess, so it's not about the tool, it's about people. And I think that most of the time we abuse those kind of technology. That's a great answer. Well, if there are no further questions, um, and it seems not, thank you again, Marco. A big round of applause. <laughs>